there are really only two types of vaccines, the live attenuated vaccines and the inactivated or killed vaccines. Both types of vaccines constitute what we refer to as active immunization. The main difference between the two is that live or attenuated vaccines are capable of replicating within an individual and in fact need to in order to produce an optimal immune response, whereas inactivated or killed vaccines do not replicate in an individual. In this way, we can give vaccines, inactivated vaccines, to patients who are immunocompromised without them getting sick. An ideal vaccine elicits an immune response similar to that produced by the natural infection with that pathogen, including the immunologic memory, without causing the illness associated with the microbe. Protection normally occurs in the form of antigen-specific antibody and, in some cases, T-cell-mediated immunity. You need to choose a strain that will give enough stimulation to create a strong immune response, but not such a strong amount of stimulation or replication in the case of live attenuated vaccines that the patient will get sick. So let's first talk about this idea of different virulence or different ability to cause disease in a strain. This concept has actually been around from a, for a really long time. Basically, these live attenuated vaccines are derived from the wild or disease-causing strain of the pathogen. This concept dates back way before Edward Jenner developed the vaccine to smallpox, actually back even further to kind of what were the original pox parties or the concept of variolation. Prior to the smallpox vaccine, the process of variolation or inoculation was when we would take live smallpox from a pustule on an infected person who had a relatively mild case of smallpox, hopefully, and then place it in the open wound of a healthy person. Historical records indicate that the person would become ill seven to eight days later, and then often would recover from a much less severe case of smallpox, or at least that was the theory. However, the practice was not 100%, and many people died, but it was kind of an early form of live vaccination. And before you laugh at our ancestors, it's still happening. We still have pox parties, most typically for chicken pox. In fact, my own mother and aunt participated in one when I was a child. Mainly the thinking being your kid was going to get chicken pox once it was let loose in the class, so why not choose your time that it's going to happen? And maybe your strain by choosing a kid who seemed to have a less severe form. However, you can't really control how one child versus another child will respond to the infection and whether or not that strain is actually a less virulent strain. So pox parties can actually be fairly dangerous. And we're seeing them again not only with chicken pox, even though now that is a vaccine-eligible disease, we're also seeing them with things like mumps and measles, which parents are potentially choosing not to vaccinate their children and instead exposing them using these pox parties where they feel they can control the infection and also expose their child to a natural infection, which can, in some instances, provide more long-lasting memory. So since we don't really encourage people to attend pox parties, we derive a live or attenuated strain from the wild or disease-causing strain. They become attenuated or weakened in a laboratory setting through mutations that typically appear after repeated culture. An effective live attenuated vaccine contains organisms that must replicate in the vaccinated person enough to stimulate an immune response. Live attenuated vaccines produce immunity in most recipients with only one dose, except for those that are administered orally, like for instance um, the Sabin vaccine for polio or flu mist. Now, here's another instance where that pox party theory doesn't really hold up. Remember that a live attenuated vaccine replicates within the patient. So actually, the type of immunity you get from a natural infection, let's say that's your primary exposure, and this would be your secondary exposure if we're talking natural, is actually almost identical to what we see with vaccination with a live attenuated. 
patients who receive a live attenuated, you still get replication of the virus. So they wound up getting almost an identical primary and secondary response to the same pathogen. Because live attenuated actually looks so much like the natural infection that the responses to the two, the differences between them, is practically negligible. So much so that the immune system can't distinguish an infection with an attenuated strain or the wild type strain. If a vaccine is given through an oral or a mucosal route, you might get IgA produced in the vaccinated host instead of IgG. The, most, the more similar the vaccine is to the strain of disease that's causing, the better the immune response to the vaccine. Now, although vaccination with a live attenuated strain provides an immune response that is very similar to natural infection. Just like natural infection, it's the presence of the pathogen that leads to long-term immunity. So if we don't see the pathogen for a long time, whether we were vaccinated with a live attenuated strain or were able to acquire the infection naturally, our population of B and T cells that are capable of responding the second time around is going to go down. It's going to wane. And there is some evidence that it can happen more quickly with live attenuated vaccines compared to natural infection, but not strong evidence. So the two can still be somewhat compared. And we actually saw this very recently in Illinois. University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana in 2015 had an outbreak of mumps now, what was curious about this is that a lot of the people who came down with the mumps actually were vaccinated appropriately against mumps. The problem here is that your average college-age individual is 18 to 22. Well, we're vaccinated for mumps when we are very young. So it had been presumably about 15 years since many of these students had even come in contact with mumps meaning that their B cells, their memory B cells, which survive for about 10 years, likely had died out. And at that point, the protection waned, and now they were basically exposed or vulnerable to mumps as if they'd never seen it before. So what the university suggested was that students returning to campus get vaccinated first, and that very effectively boosted the immune response within these previously vaccinated individuals and protected them, and the outbreak ended. Let's now move to the inactivated or killed vaccines. Inactivated vaccines are produced by growing the bacterium or virus in culture media, then inactivating it with heat or chemicals. This process can be done with a whole cell, like a whole bacterium or virion. And typically, a, a chemical known as formalin is used to inactivate the bacterium. But there are other methods for fixing or chemically inactivating them. Remember that these inactivated vaccines are not alive and cannot replicate. In addition to inactivated whole cell vaccines, there are fractionated or subunit vaccines. In this case, the vaccine will only contain the portion of the microorganism that actually elicits an immune response in the population. This could include the polysaccharide capsule of pneumococcus, a bacteria, or when we're talking about the flu vaccine, which most people get each year, we're talking about the HA subunit. The HA subunit is a glycoprotein that exists on the surface of the flu virion, and you guessed it, we make antibodies to it. But there's also changes that occur in the HA subunit every year, so we have to get vaccinated every year to kind of create responses to the new HA subunits. Another example of this would be the tetanus toxoid vaccine. So when we're thinking about tetanus infection, we're thinking about infection with the microorganism known as clostridium tetany. Tetany, or clostridium tetany, produces a toxin known as tetanus toxin. And it's the tetanus toxin that actually is really deadly to us and causes disease. So what we've done is we've taken the toxin and fixed it with formalin, just like in the whole cell. When we fix it with formalin, when we fix the toxin with formalin, you make a toxoid. And this is good because we make antibodies to the toxin. 
unfortunately, will be dead from the toxin before we can make any antibody response to the toxin. So by immunizing people with the full toxoid, we're able to have antibodies in the bloodstream ready to go and memory B cells ready to go that will attack this toxoid or the toxin should we encounter it. The last type of vaccine that we talk about are the polysaccharide vaccines. The polysaccharide vaccines are basically a form of a fractionated subunit vaccine. Polysaccharide vaccines are made of long sugar chains found on the surface capsule of certain bacteria. Pure polysaccharide vaccines are available for three diseases currently. This would be pneumococcal, meningococcal, and salmonella typhi. So, now we have a little bit of a conundrum. Remember that memory B cells can only be made with T cell help. Well, do T cells see polysaccharides? Nope. So when we're talking about a polysaccharide vaccine, we're typically talking about a T independent vaccine. So how does that work if vaccines are meant to provide memory? Well, these vaccines can stimulate B cells. They typically do not work very well in children that are younger than two years of age. And this is because the immune system is fairly immature and not very adept at facilitating activation of B cells yet. Because they are T independent, they are not as efficacious as, say, a protein antigen vaccine. The antibody induced with the polysaccharide vaccines has less functional activity, and therefore, because it's T independent, the predominant antibody that is going to be made as a result of a polysaccharide vaccination is, you guessed it, IgM. So because polysaccharide antigens fail to activate T cells, they don't trigger germinal centers, and there's no immune memory response. Therefore, you're going to need repeat doses of polysaccharide vaccines, usually so that you can get more and more antibody production within the blood, so that you have this titer that exists within the blood that is providing protection. And each time you're vaccinated, you're kind of creating new plasma B cells. You're starting the whole process over again to create new plasma B cells that will create IgM. So once a person has been vaccinated, you'll activate B cells, which will then differentiate into plasma cells that are capable of secreting IgM. They'll secrete low levels of low affinity IgM for weeks to months, as long as the plasma cell survives. Once the plasma cell dies, though, eventually the antibodies will start being degraded, and you'll have to start the process all over again.